This video has two purposes. The first is to talk briefly about Erwin Chargoff, and then the second thing is to talk about the consequences of some of his discoveries when it came to uh, the application of, of nucleotides. Now, the first thing to talk about with Chargoff is a little bit about his history. Uh, he grew up in Austria-Hungary and then ended up immigrating to the United States during the Nazi era. Once he got to the U.S., he uh, eventually ends up becoming a biochemist, and he's working at Columbia University. So while he's there, he's studying genetics, and he ends up establishing rules that lay the foundation for further discoveries in the field of genetics. He's one of the big uh, contributors to Watson and Crick eventually figuring out the structure of DNA. But the thing to talk about first are his two rules that he established, and then things that we know about nucleotides because of Erwin Chargoff and his research. So the first thing to talk about with Chargoff's rule is he established this pattern. Uh, what he was doing was he was isolating the genetic material in a variety of different species. And what he found was no matter what the species was that he was looking at, the relative amounts of guanine were always relatively close to the amounts of cytosine, and then the amounts of thymine also uh, equaled the amounts of adenine. This was true whether he was looking at plants, whether he was looking at mammals, insects, it didn't matter what the species was, he was seeing similar levels of all of these different groups of nucleotides. What he eventually established was he knew for some reason thymine and adenine went together and that guanine and cytosine went together. Now what we'll talk about in a few minutes is how these things actually bond together and, and he was absolutely right. Uh, he didn't necessarily understand all of the biochemistry behind it, but he did know that this was a pattern that he had well established, that guanine and cytosine always went together, and then thymine and adenine always went together, regardless of the species that he was looking at. Uh, there's a way to remember this. I mean, obviously, I guess the, the easiest way is just to, to memorize it. But if you're looking for some kind of a memory trick, uh, if you remember the phrase that the car goes in the garage, so we've got C pairing with G, and then the apple goes in the tree, so we've got A pairing with T there. It's just an easy way to go through and remember these. Um, we oftentimes refer to the different nucleotides just by the first letter. So C, A, G, and T, because guanine, thymine, cytosine, and adenine, it's, it's a little cumbersome just to work with that all the time. But uh, this is Chargoff's first rule. He established this pattern that cytosine always goes with guanine and adenine always goes with thymine. Now, his second rule, and we'll get into some further explanation on this in a minute, but he found out that the relative amounts of adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine varied from one species to another. So to clarify what we mean by this, the relative amounts, these were still pairing together, right? Adenine and thymine were still always going together, and then cytosine and guanine were always going together. But what he found was like there was different ratios of each of those in species. So some species had more cytosine and guanine, and other species had more adenine and thymine uh, than others. So he found that these two things were not constant among species. He found that they always went together, but some species, for example, would have more cytosine and guanine, other species would have more adenine and thymine. Uh, so this just seems like a detail at first, but we'll expand upon this and we'll talk about why this one's important. So the reason uh, this was important, and this involves getting into the structure of genetic material a little bit, genetic material is made up of two things. Right? It's made up of proteins, and it's also made up of nucleic acids. What Chargoff ended up finding was when he went through and he analyzed the genetic material from different species, he found different patterns to the way the proteins and the nucleic acids worked. What he found was that the amount of proteins were similar for species with similar amounts of genetic material. So species that had a similar amount of DNA are going to have a similar amount of protein in it. So for example, things like plants have more chromosomes than, than we do. So they're going to have more protein in their DNA, because, or I should say in their genetic material, uh, because they simply have more of it than we do. 
Uh, but the thing that he found that was important, and this is something that we need to talk about the consequences of, the amount of nucleotides varied by species. So the amount of protein pretty much goes up directly with the amount of DNA that's present in the organism. But the amount of nucleotides were different from one species to another. So what this is helping to establish is something that Hershey and Chase also establish, another group of scientists that we talk about in the video series here. Uh, the idea that genetic information is passed on in nucleotides. It's passed on through nucleic acids, not through proteins. Uh, there was a lot of debate about this at Chargoff's time because people knew that proteins and nucleotides both compose DNA. They just didn't know which one was the one that was responsible for building genes and like actually passing on your individual traits. So this is an important piece of evidence that nucleotides are the important genetic characteristic that's actually passing on the traits. Uh, what we find out later on is the proteins are important as well, but they're mostly there for, uh, for structure. And, and we'll talk about that when we get into the structure of DNA a bit more in a later video. So the final thing to discuss then is what are nucleotides. And we can break nucleotides down into two groups. So one group is called purines, the other group is called pyrimidines. And we have all the individual nucleotides down here. And I've tried to stay fairly consistent with the colors as we work our way through the video. But one of the things to look at when it comes to these is their general structure. Each one of these rings on the inside represents rings of mostly carbons. Uh, there, there's other elements involved in this, and you don't have to worry about the like, molecular structure of these for the most part. The, the important thing to realize when it comes to talking about purines and pyrimidines is just the number of carbon rings. So the way it works is that guanine and adenine are both purines. Uh, they are ones with two carbon rings. The pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine. They have a single carbon ring. Now, the way we find that these end up pairing, as we said earlier, is that G always pairs with C, right? So we said the car goes in the garage. So you end up with one purine and one pyrimidine pairing together. Um, and then the apples go in the tree, right? Adenine always pairs with thymine. So again, we have one purine and then one pyrimidine pairing up. Um, the key to this is actually the bond number. So we'll get this one out of here and talk about our final concept here. Uh, if we have G going with C and then A going with T, we'll end up doing this sort of spinning these a little bit. They're a bugger when they're small like that. There we go. So the, the key to this is the number of bonds that these things are making. Uh, if we're looking at G and C, those two end up making three bonds. So we'll draw like three lines between the two of them. And then adenine and thymine uh, make two bonds. So what they end up doing is, is they share hydrogens between them. And the reason that Chargoff was seeing C and G always pairing up together, and then seeing A and T always pairing up together, is because they're making the same number of bonds. If you think of these things like puzzle pieces, even though we would still have a double ring with G, pairing up with a single ring with T, so you'd still have the right number of, of one purine and one pyrimidine, they don't make the correct number of bonds with one another. So guanine is looking to make three bonds, so it cannot pair then correctly uh, with thymine, which is why we always see G and C going together, and then A and T going together. It has to do with the number of bonds that they're making. So G and C making three bonds, whereas A and T only making those two bonds. So I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video, and I hope it was helpful for you.